I would like to make a few comments. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. We see Americans hating each other, fighting each other, killing each other at home. There is a religious war going on in this country. It is a cultural war. This war is for the soul of America. Because of the way this society is organized, you have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. Our side, our side, our side. We are a people in a quandary about the present. We are a people in search of our future. And as we see and hear these things, millions of Americans cry out in anguish. Did we come all this way for this? It all seems a long way from a time when politics was a national passion and sometimes even fun. Attempting on a larger scale to fulfill the promise of America. Three, two, one. We are met here as Americans, not as Democrats or Republicans, to solve that problem. Welcome to the Pothole Problem Podcast. I'm your host, Jack Miller, and this is episode 28. And as episode 28, that means that I'm getting very close to the end of my first year of podcasting. There are a planned 30 episodes in this first year. I've been doing one every week during the Portland State University term, taking winter and spring break off, and I'm about to take summer break off. After today's interview, there will be two more episodes, but this is the last of my guests for the season. My guest this week is Sonia Montalbano. She's running for a judicial position in Multnomah County. It's unusual for people to be running for judge in a contested election. And a big part of what she talks about in the first part of the interview is what is unique about judicial elections. So I won't anticipate what you're going to learn in the interview about that process. But I will talk about some things that we didn't get to discuss, which is how do people get to be judges? And why is it so unusual for there to be a contested judicial election? There are plenty of elected judicial positions. On my ballot, there are 20 judicial races. However, only three of those are being contested. Two of them have two candidates. Sonia's race has six candidates. Now, the way that our electoral system works is that in these nonpartisan races, the spring election, which is coming up in just over a week, is the primary election. If you win 50% plus one of the votes cast in the primary election, you win the election, and there's no general election for your position. Obviously, if you're running uncontested, you don't have to run again in November. You're done. If you're running a two-person race, one of those people is going to get 50% plus one, so they are also done. The race that Sonia's running in with six candidates, it's possible that one of those six will get 50% plus one, but what is most likely is that the vote will be split among them in a way that will prevent that, And the way our rules are is that the top two vote getters then go to what you could think of as a runoff election in November. We normally think of November as the general election. In these nonpartisan races, if a November election is necessary, it's a runoff between the top two vote getters, and then one of them gets 50% plus one. So Sonia is running an election that is unusual for a couple of reasons. One, the vast majority of judicial elections, and this year's ballot is typical, are uncontested. Occasionally, there'll be a contested election, an incumbent will have a challenger, and usually it's just one challenger. What's rare about the race Sonia's in is that it's an open seat, and it's an open seat that is going to be elected instead of appointed. And here's the strange thing about our judicial electoral system is that all judicial positions in Oregon are elected. But what often happens is that judges retire before their term is up. That creates a judicial vacancy, and our state constitution gives the governor the power to fill that vacancy, thus creating an incumbent who has never been elected but is sitting in that seat, and typically people don't run against an incumbent. What normally happens, even though it really is a circumvention of the constitutional system, is that judges are appointed and They don't face challengers, and then basically they just retire when they want to retire. If they retire before their term ends, their seat is filled by the governor, and then that person runs as an incumbent and probably runs unchallenged. It's therefore pretty rare to see an open seat that is challenged by a bunch of people. And one of the reasons why this is an open seat is because the judge who held this position decided that he was going to stay in his 
chair until the end of the term rather than retiring early and giving the governor the ability to create a new incumbent who would probably run unopposed. It's just an indication of what goes on in a system where we have judicial elections all the time. Every judicial position is elected, and many people don't even realize this, partly because so many of those races are unchallenged, and so you see it on your ballot, and you don't even probably fill it out. Why would you bother filling out a one-person race? It seems ridiculous. Also, our national judiciary is filled entirely by people who are appointed by the president. And so we're familiar with, at the level that most people are familiar with government, at the national level, we're familiar with non-elected judicial positions. But in the states and counties, almost all judicial positions are actually elected in the United States. So democracy goes into the judicial branch everywhere, but at the federal level. And that's just not a feature that's very familiar. But as you can tell from the way I've described the way the system goes here, functionally, not formally, but functionally, is that for the most part, judicial positions get vacated by retirement and the governor fills that and that creates a new incumbent who does have to run for re-election, but when you don't have to run against anybody, you're not really an elected official. Sonia is actually running in one of the rare contested elections, 20 judicial elections, only three of them contested. Two of those are going to be decided in the primary because there's only two candidates. So it's an unusual situation. That's a lot of poli sci civics for the introduction to this particular episode. I'm not sure it's such a great idea, but there it is. And I'm going to get off of that by getting into the interview. So I'm on the phone with Sonia Montalbano. Thanks for joining me for the show today, Sonia. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. You are running for judge position. This is your first elective office you're seeking. Is that correct? If you don't count high school, yes. What did you run for in high school? I ran for and won vice president of my high school in my senior year. So this is your first non-school electoral run. What is it that got you to decide to jump into the electoral arena? Because it's it's quite a thing. Well, it, I, yes, it is. And it's a very unusual situation. I don't know if your listeners know, but judges are almost always appointed by the governor. That's how the process works. There's a number of hoops that you jump through. I have gone through that process once before, but an election, especially an open election, the last time there was really an open seat was 12 years ago when uh, now uh, Judge Cheryl Albright was elected and she made it through the primary. She was one of the top two and then she won in November. In this circumstance, I had put my name in to be considered for appointment the next time that there was an open position. But Greg Silver, who is the judge retiring and creating this opening, actually called me and let me know that he was going to be doing this and that he told the governor and he told his fellow judges. But I've worked with Judge Silver for a number of years through an organization called the Gus Solomon uh, Inn of Court, basically a collegial organization where lawyers and judges work together to promote professionalism, ethics, and uh, education about the legal system. And he said, Sonia, I am going to retire. It's going to create an open seat. There's going to be an election, and I think that you should run for it. I was thrilled and honored, and then I did some due diligence and really thought about it because it is a very different thing to run for a seat than to put your name in and go through the process of being appointed. Part of the due diligence that I did was talking with my husband and consulting with some some other people who I know and respect. I looked back at my own personal experience and I've always been an avid student of politics and I've always been engaged in what's going on in the community around me, both at a community service level and at a political level. So for example, one of the organizations I was involved with for a number of years was the Oregon League of Conservation Voters. I was on the steering committee for Multnomah County. That organization puts out a report card on a statewide level of how different legislators in Oregon rate, you know, what's their grade when it comes to environmental issues. Being on the steering committee, my job with my fellow steering committee members was to interview candidates who were seeking the endorsement of the Oregon League of Conservation Voters. In doing so, we would talk to them about what is your platform? What is your campaign? What is your plan? Ask them a lot of different questions. And then if we decided to endorse them, we would work with them and try and support 
their efforts to the extent that we could. Doing that, I got a lot of background in the political campaign process. I also then, you know, after I stopped working with them, I supported different candidates that were running just as in my individual capacity for, you know, city council or state legislature or mayor. And then 12 years ago, Cheryl Albright was a friend of mine at the time we'd gone to law school together. I had always thought she would be a fabulous addition to the bench and said, you should run, you should run someday. And the opportunity came for her. And I said, you should do it and I will help you. We had a great team of people. She had a great campaign manager, total grassroots campaign, worked our butts off and helped get her elected. So after thinking about all that, I said, you know, this is not how I thought I might have the opportunity to become a judge, but I think I'm pretty well equipped to do it. And if I don't take this opportunity now, it would be one of those things that I regretted probably for the rest of my life. So you had a lot of experience behind the scenes helping candidates get elected. And in fact, not just legislative candidates, but a judicial candidate as well. What is the difference now being out front as the candidate? And what have been some of the surprises you've experienced being the person whose name is on the ballot? One of the things that's really different about a judicial campaign compared to partisan political positions, you cannot ask for money, which I really actually appreciate. One of the things I didn't like uh, was even when I was campaigning on behalf of uh, an individual I was supporting was asking people to give me money. I was more of someone who would organize an event and people could come and then they could donate if they wished. I would create opportunities for donation, but I didn't really want to ask. So you can't do that as a judicial candidate. And that is frustrating on some levels, but also I'm really grateful on other levels. But it takes away one of the most obnoxious tasks of politics is asking for and raising money. How do you fund a campaign then? I contribute some of my own money because if I'm not going to believe in what I'm doing, I shouldn't expect anyone else to. Also, uh, there's a committee of individuals who have committed to supporting me. They go and fundraise, you know, for, for the benefit of my campaign. What have you found that the voters are looking for in a judicial candidate? Most of where my perspective of what voters are looking for in a judicial candidate comes from my work as a lawyer. The reality is, and this is uh, you know something I hope to work on changing just by virtue of the fact that I'm participating in an election, is a lot of voters don't vote down the ballot. They vote for the offices that they know and that they're familiar with, and they stop. Judicial races are pretty far down on the ballot. So, you know, when I announced to a number of people, hey, I'm going to be running for this position, I was disappointed, but not entirely surprised to hear how many said, really? Judges run? And it's like, yes, there are actually occasions when when this does happen. Because even when you run for re-election, they're almost always unopposed. And so people see there's just no one running against them. They don't pay any attention to it. What are the challenges of being a candidate in this particular kind of race? You can't raise money directly. Are there other campaign laws that restrict your activities, or is that the only restriction? There is a judicial code of ethics. If you are a candidate for a judicial position, you have to follow the code of judicial ethics. One of the things that you may not do as a judge or a candidate is take a position or advocate on behalf of a candidate or a ballot measure that you believe in. You know, you really have to divorce yourself from the political process. And I have to say that that was, you know, you asked me earlier, what, what, are, what was your thought process? Why did you do this? And I had to think really hard about that. Being someone who has been involved in politics for as long as I have been. I mean, this is something I've been made aware of you know, since I was a, a kid, my dad used to read the paper and talk to me about what was going on and who the president was and uh, how, how it worked and who our local representatives were. It was just something that was always discussed and we were aware of it. And so I really was like, well, OK, I can't do that. That's a big challenge to me. That's different from what other people have to go through. How do you speak to voters and potential supporters? You know, you can't talk about issues. What do you do? It sounds really weird. It is really weird. But what you can do is you can take positions as they relate to the judiciary, the law, not law in the sense how a law should be interpreted or how it could be changed. But where do you stand in terms of the judicial system? That is something that 
I've talked about with a number of people and worked on already for many years in different capacities. So you can advocate as a judge for better funding for the judiciary. One of the things uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize is in 2008, when we had the economic downturn, the recession, funding was cut across all the different state agencies, including the judicial department. And they eliminated a number of positions. People were sharing staff. They shut the phones down. They were open two hours a day because they didn't have people there to answer the phone. Since that time, there has been, until very relatively recently, an economic uh, turnaround for Oregon. And yet funding has never come close to where it was back in 2008. Courts are overwhelmed. They are just facing so many different crises that are impacting the lives of all of us in Multnomah County and in Portland and throughout the country, quite frankly. There are increasing numbers of homeless people who are being brought into the court system. There is a mental health crisis in this country. Opioid and addiction issues are on the rise. And all those people end up in the court system. Not all, but a lot of them end up in the court system. So the courts are overwhelmed. You can let the public know and the voters What's your approach to that? Well, I'm certainly going to work towards increasing funding for legal aid. That's something I've been a supporter of for many, many years, uh, working with the Campaign for Equal Justice uh, on their advisory committee, helping them raise funds for legal aid. We, we have such a, a dearth of funds, uh, so many people needing legal assistance and so few actually getting it. Another thing that you can do is, for me personally, I am someone who... When I look at the court system, I see some problems and I am, if you ask anyone who knows me, they'll say, well, Sonia's a problem solver. Get her in there. She's a workhorse. I'll try and work to figure out a way to fix this. And so what are the ways that we can get people out of the cycles that often they get involved in the court system and then they just keep coming back and keep coming back? And there are, I think, really creative ways that we can approach these issues For example, we have a drug court, we have a community court where people who are facing some addiction issues or people who commit very low level crimes become introduced to the judicial system and the programs that are in place will allow them to avoid being imprisoned or, you know, being faced with a significant fine that could really impact their ability to, you know, make their rent. It keeps them out of the judicial system. What I'd like to see is a houselessness court where what we do, similar to the drug court, someone who is finds themselves in front of the court, they're directed towards resources that will help them. And those will often overlap with mental health care resources and addiction resources. You know, another thing that you hear a lot of people talking about, and, uh, you know, I just truly believe in this, is the concept of restorative or trans- transformative justice. That's where if a crime is committed, rather than making uh, you know, a decision based on prosecutor is going to bring charges, this person is going to face them, there's going to be a trial, there's going to be jury, this person is going to be face you know, significant imprisonment. What they will do is if everyone's on board, you talk to the victim, you talk to the district attorney, you talk to the defense attorney, you talk to the defendant, and you talk to the judge, and you all sort of sit down. And it's a process that everyone takes part in, and it's to really promote healing and a sense that justice is done in a way that just merely sending one to someone to jail or you know prison you're not going to fix that problem you know it's just been found over and over when people participate in that process you have fewer rates of recidivism or repeat offenders you have people feeling who are victimized feeling that they were really heard and that the right outcome was reached I mean, you think about so many cases where some horrible tragedy befalls a family, a crime is committed, and then you see the family members forgive the person who did the thing to their loved one. And it's because they, I I think it's because, you know, we recognize forgiveness is important. It helps the victims heal. You know, and if everyone's on board with it, that's something I'd love to see. So that's a part of what I can talk about. If I'm a judge and I'm elected, I will work to develop pilot programs to increase funding for legal aid, to come up with creative solutions to the problems that are facing the court.
You're listening to the Pothole Problem Podcast, created by White Tiger Productions. At White Tiger Productions, we create experiences. If you have an idea for a podcast, a workshop, or a show of any kind, we'll help you go from concept to execution. We provide creative direction and production support. We've got a podcast studio, writers and storytellers, sound engineers and editors, designers, videographers, hosts, creative coaches, everything you need to manifest your creative potential. You name it or even vaguely describe it, and we'll take you from dream to finished product. White Tiger Productions. You can do what you think, and we can help you. Visit us at youcandowhatyouthink.com and tell us what you're thinking about. You seem very passionate about these issues of judicial reform. I'm going to get to the question that I ask all of my guests because I really want to hear what you have to say about this, which is, what is something that used to outrage you and no longer does, and why the change? I really, when I was younger, was outraged that we did not have term limits on elected officials. Of course, we needed term limits. We needed to have new ideas and fresh ideas and different perspectives and people who were just in there and not really doing anything. They just, you know, they were influenced by all the people who kept getting them reelected. We needed to have, so that's something where I I really believe that term limits were something that were uh, needed. Now, I will say part of that as time has gone on, I realize is because of the process by which people uh, get elected in terms of money and the role it plays in politics. Still outraged about that, but I'm no longer uh, hold that opinion as as strongly as I did because what I've come to value over time and with my own experience is that institutional knowledge is really important. You know, one of the things we hear all the time and is when you have a diversity of opinions and voices in a decision-making process, the decision will be better for it. If you are going to exclude the voices of those who have been through things or considered issues, uh, wrestled with them before, then I think you're doing your constituency a disservice. I do think that if you aren't going to have term limits, everyone needs to be committed to being open to new ideas and continuing to educate themselves about the issues that they are working on uh, rather than hold fast to calcified ideas. That's one thing that used to outrage me that now, perhaps in my waning years, (laughs) I feel differently about. Right. And it sounds like that was a principled problem. You had a principled problem with people just running and running again and being able to raise a lot of money and being able to be successful. And that as you saw how the political process and the policymaking process worked, you realized that throwing away all of that accumulated institutional knowledge and wisdom maybe had a worse effect than the benefit of ending the system where people just run and win and run and win. I think it's pretty common for people to get over outrage, youthful outrage particularly, that they just get experience with the world and they see that their earlier outrage was missing a big part of the story about how things really go. Is that fair to say in your case? That's exactly, yes. You sound like a very calm person. Do you feel driven by your outrage and by your passion in terms of what makes you want to run for this office and what makes you want to get in there and roll up your sleeves and try to fix some of these problems? You know, I don't think outrage is the right word for it for me in terms of, you know, I really think my passion is more of what drives me. I became a lawyer to help people. It, It sounds so corny, but honestly, Jack, my main point for being is to make the world a better place for my community, the people around us. And hopefully that then blossoms and grows and expands and it's better on a larger scale. One of the reasons I decided not to go into politics, which is what my original goal was, was because I saw the process that politicians had to go through, raising all this money, um, kowtow, spending so much time working on getting reelected <laughs> rather than working on the issues that they really cared about. I'm just a passionate person about improving people's lives and doing what I can to do that. It's what makes me go. Now that you're involved in electoral politics, and even though it's for a judicial position, a nonpartisan judicial position, and there are certain limits on the kind of campaigning you can do, Does this give you a different perspective than you used to have on politicians? I think my view is unchanged because in the course of my community service and involvement with organizations, I've really encountered a lot of people who I respected, who ran for public office. So I am sympathetic to them in that they have to 
do the things they do to get the job that they want. I mean, most politicians, I would like to believe, at least the ones that I encounter in Oregon, they really just want to serve the public. And they have to raise money to get their own job. I can't let you off the phone before we face what is the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about at all. You and I are on a phone interview, whereas normally I would have hoped to have you in the studio for a face-to-face interview, and that's because we're in the middle of the coronavirus quarantining. Uh, We have a shelter-in-place order from the governor. How has that impacted your activities as a judicial candidate? It can't not have impacted it. Well, at this point in the campaign process, usually you are out meeting people and talking to them and getting to know them and listen and hear what their concerns are and also introducing yourself to them and you know why you're running for the office that you're running for. I'm very much a people person and I do really well with face to face and all of a sudden I'm trying to learn how to campaign in the age of appropriate social distancing. But so is everybody else. What are some of the things that you're having to do? I mean, I imagine that social media has become a more important part when you can't do face-to-face campaigning. Yeah, I think social media is definitely becoming more important. We're doing things like Zoom meetings with people, Zoom coffees. Other people are out there promoting you to their friends. We are probably going to be doing you know, more mail than we would have thought before. We're constantly adapting. And coming up with new things, you know, postcards, neighbor, neighbor, postcards, all the different things that you can do without being closer than six feet. You said earlier, one of the things about face-to-face campaigning is that listening to people and hearing what their concerns are. On social media, you can read comments and on Zoom meetings, of course, you can listen. But with postcards and mailers, there's no listening possible. So how are you making up for that listening opportunity deficit? Well, that's what the virtual coffees and the meetings with people will be about. That will be the opportunity for me. You know, as I said, I'll introduce myself, explain who I am, tell me, and then their opportunity to tell me what are their concerns when it comes to someone who is potentially going to be on the bench. As I said, you know, same thing that was said when I told people I was running was said when Judge Albright ran, you know, she was in a parade in Troutdale and someone said, I didn't know judges ran. I've never met a judge. And so I think it's really important, even if it's just visually, you know, put yourself not just visually, but visually with an opportunity for an exchange. And it it might happen on a smaller scale, but, you know, we might figure out a way to make it happen on a, a larger scale. You know, this is really made clear this entire situation is you really need strong leadership. You know, you need someone who can adapt and who can, when they're faced with a a brand new unprecedented scenario, assess, take the time, make a smart decision and make a decision on what you're going to do. Because that's all you can do, right? You can overthink it and hypothesize 90,000 different outcomes and potential routes, but it's, you know, you got to take the information you have and you got to make a decision. And, you know, that's what you have to do as a judge. So that's what you also have to do in the era of COVID-19 campaigning. Well, it sounds like, you know, you have a good spirit about it and you are taking the steps that will allow you to do the things that you want to do. You want to hear what people's concerns are, but you also want to spread your message that you are a person who has a particular kind of character and is passionate about these reform efforts. I wish you good luck. I really want to thank you for joining me on the call today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It was a pleasure. Okay, well, that's another interview for the Pothole Problem podcast. And as I mentioned in the introduction to this episode, it's the last interview for this first year of the show. I have two more episodes planned. Next week, Zane will be interviewing me once again. Next week is election day in Oregon. Tuesday's election day. This podcast drops on Mondays. So I'm doing an episode on how people respond to elections. I already have the title of it. The title is, That's Not Fair. That's kind of a snarky title because that's something that I heard from my children an awful lot when they were younger. And what they really meant was, that's not what I want. They would use fair in a clearly self-interested and twisted way, as children often do, to mean I didn't get what I wanted. And I think that they experienced it as being not fair 
even though they were incorrect. It was fair. It was just not what they wanted. A lot of American voters feel like our electoral system has certain aspects that are not fair. And while they don't tend to go around like thwarted toddlers saying, that's not fair, some people actually do, but there is a sense of unfairness in our electoral system. But what I'm going to do is Zane's going to ask me questions and he's not going to show me those questions in advance. We've already talked about this. He's going to interview me about why it is that there's this kind of widespread feeling of dissatisfaction about fairness, competitiveness, responsiveness in our electoral system. And that will be to celebrate the day before Oregon's election day. That's what's going to be coming up. What you just heard was Sonia Montalbano, and I want to thank her for the very thoughtful interview conducted by phone when she was, in fact, in the middle of a busy campaign for a rare judicial position. I, of course, want to thank, as always, all of you, my listeners. Without you, I would be talking into a microphone that would be going out into the world with no benefit whatsoever. So thank you very much. I'm going to finish up today with a song from an artist that has appeared on the show before, but not for many, many months. Back in the fall, I had a song by Frankie Holiday, and here's another one. It's called Sister Run. Wow.